Greetings, Guardians. My name is Bife here. The raid is out. Preservation is out. It's time to talk a bit about both of them. Also, programming notes at the start of video. Sorry to Larry, who hates it when I talk about video stuff and how videos are going to work at the very start of each of these videos, but Larry, first of all, get over it. Second of all, this stuff is important. People need to know this so they can understand the way content's going to get delivered. Firstly, regarding contest. I know it was extended, and I know that means fewer people than most would have liked have been able to actually get the raid done after contest, and therefore we're jumping into spoiler territory when some people haven't had the chance to play. So in order to limit how much of the actual raid itself is being spoiled, I want to go ahead and focus predominantly on elements of the lore that are from preservation or from the lore books, which again you can also get from preservation. I want to cover the raid itself and the actions we take in it last, if possible. And as a result, whilst yes, we are inevitably going to be covering a lot of stuff that comes from the raid, and we are going to be talking about the main boss, even in this video, you're hopefully not going to have the main experience of the raid spoiled for you. This approach is going to hopefully make it so that if you don't intend on touching the raid until the weekend, you've got a bit of a chance to catch up. But don't count on this being forever, this approach is slowly going to wane as the week goes on. I can't keep pushing back this content forever, but I'm going to go ahead and try to give more people a bit of a runway, even if now we're openly talking about the raid on the channel, and even if there are spoilers in the thumbnails. Hopefully, especially considering that the rest of the community is openly posting screenshots of the boss and everything else, this will give you guys all a bit of time in order to ensure that you actually get all of your raid stuff done, and hopefully this reduces the number of you that are spoiled. Sorry in advance, this is the best I think I can do, but yeah. As a result, today we're going to be talking about Worm Gods, or Worm Mothers as it turns out. If this goes out in time, I suppose happy International Women's Day to Saita. Yeah, you'll understand who I'm talking about in a bit. Uh, the lore video today is going to be covering a core element that you can see in preservation and in the raid itself, and so I feel like this is a very safe bit of territory to start with. Secondly, the lore on the raid and preservation is going to be a big old series of videos, and that's by your request. Thank you to everybody who gave me input on that in the last video. It was really cool to get a consensus, and I'm so glad we're able to cover it like this. Okay, programming stuff over. Larry, you can return and come and sit back down at the back of the class. So, today I wanted to answer a question that is clearly at the front and centre of people's minds, and of course, that is going to be the case if people got into the first encounter of the raid or just did the uh, preservation mission, and that is quite simply, what the hell is going on with the massive worm god in the middle of the pyramid? Well, today we're going to go ahead and find out. To understand that, we're going to dive into the Titan armor, the lore from the preservation mission, and we're going to talk a bit about the Books of Sorrow. So strap in, this is old hive lore, but it all relates back to the Disciple of the Witness that you face within the Pyramid, and of course it's going to relate to everything that we learn from the preservation mission, and a lot to the hive and their lore. So, for those of you who have absolutely no idea or understanding of what's going on, here's a quick explainer, although this doesn't go into the truly basic elements. There is a being called Rolk, the first disciple of the Witness, and they are trying to spread the vision of the Witness, and that vision, of course, is the Sword Logic. Those who follow the Sword Logic believe in brutality and killing to the point where everything is surviving because it is as strong as possible. This is known as the Sword Logic, and it brings things to arrive at the final shape. It's this cataclysmic place for the universe that is meant to help it exist in that same ordered continuum for eternity. That's what we can glean from the new lore, at very least. In doing so, Rulk and the Witness arrived at the planet of Fundament. Upon their arrival, it became clear that the Traveler intended to bless one of the races on the surface of the planet, known as the Krill, a species that lives on the world below. The Krill would one day become the Hive, thanks to the actions of Rulk and the Darkness, and down below in Fundament's oceans, there were a set of creatures that would help them accomplish this. They would be massive worms that would one day come to be called the Worm Gods. And there was also a massive creature guarding them, known as the Leviathan, which had essentially locked them away in the deep of Fundament's oceans for eons. This is where our story really begins. The Witness and Rulk desired the power of the Worm Gods. The power of the Worm Gods was essentially that of domination given the psychic power that the Worm Gods were able to display. And so, 
In order to steal the krill away from the Traveler and to start an extinction-level event on Fundament, it was decided that Rulk would need to dive into the oceans. But to do so, Rulk would need to face up against the Leviathan. This might sound like something tricky, but for a being as powerful as Rulk, apparently not. Take a listen to some of the lore that Rulk recites about this moment in history when we do certain actions within the preservation mission that allow us to see a little bit of why there's a giant rib in the middle. Take a look at this. It was your infinite wisdom, my witness, that led me into the planet's great sea and face to face with that which was believed to be unbeatable. You instilled in me a true understanding of wanton domination, not for pleasure, but as a means to achieve our absolute finality. When I reached the creature known to some as the Leviathan, it laid its thoughts bare. Turn from the deep, fearmonger, it relayed. I know what you seek. Press on, and you will drown in it. I do not drown. I spoke with a defiant tongue. In a mere infinitesimal measure of time, I held a rib of this beast in one hand and pushed aside its maimed vessel with the other. I rise. So the giant rib in the center of the first encounter area belonged to the Leviathan. It's placed here as a sort of memorial to that moment, and perhaps more importantly, it's something that was taken directly from this massive beast by Rolk with very little effort. The Leviathan, as a reminder, was supposed to be so massive that it made the continents of the Krill's childhood look small. Now, again, the Krill back in this time, the Proto-Hive, were meant to be very small. They were supposedly the smallest things on all of Fundament, but that still doesn't change the fact that this is a big creature. This is essentially a giant sea monster, and Rulk just casually removed one of its ribs, crippled it, didn't kill it, and then went down into the deep and used its rib for the further purposes of getting a deal and bargain with the Worm Gods. This moment is better displayed in the lore of the Titan raid armor from Vow of the Disciple. Starting with the gloves, we can begin to piece together a picture of how things progressed from here. Just so people know how all of this reads, when Destiny lore and lore entries like this get into different characters speaking, sometimes they designate the lines of those characters in different ways and with certain syntax. In this instance, there is narration from one of the worms that you'll soon know about, which is in square brackets. Then there's the dialogue from Rook, which is in quotations as normal. Then there's the dialogue from the Leviathan, which has pluses and dashes at the start and end of each line, and sometimes the worm also speaks, and that is also in normal quotations. It'll look a bit confusing, and I know the way I just described it probably doesn't help, but take a look and I'm sure you'll understand. The Leviathan stated, Stench follows you. You drag it before you. It will not consume you, for you have conquered it or so you prefer to believe. Turn back from the world-killing way, or you will live as wrath and devastation. The narrating worm notes, In this life, there are beings that bring light to others, and there are beings that bring dark. He brought dark, only dark, and was not more than an unbreakable, unstoppable force. The cruel Leviathan learned this truth the hard way. He pulled from its chest a rib many times larger than the subjugator himself, yet he wielded it as nothing. The Leviathan, winded, broken, cast its gaze on the deep below. You would not look upon the one who bested you, beast. Lift your eyes and meet mine, said Rulk. The subjugator placed the rib beneath the beast's skull and raised it. What lies beyond belongs not to you, nor to your false god hiding amongst the many moons. It belongs to that which witnesses all. 
you would do best not to forget it, regardless of your misplaced loyalties. The narrating worm notes, the rib dropped into our dwelling, our deep. With force it landed before us, uplifting the sediment of Fundament's floor into a dense cloud, from which he emerged. The worm said, You who stand on the naked hull of an ancient ship, you who stand exposed, should be annihilated by the crushing pressure and ferocious heat of the deeper Fundament. But you survive of your own will. You are not known to us. The narrating worm notes, he was to be our fate. That narrating worm is the same being that can be found within Rourke's domain, the same worm that is unnamed and massive. It is not Yul the Honest Worm, nor Ur the Ever Hunger, nor Aya the Keeper of Order. It is neither of the deceased worms, Arka the Worm of Secrets, or Zol the Will of Thousands. It is the mother of the worm gods, and the progenitor of all worms. Behold, Saita. She spoke to Rolk in this moment of his arrival, and from that moment the fate of the worms would be forever changed. I am Saita, the nurturing worm. Behold, Yul and Aya and Zol and Ur and Akka, the virtuous worms. Look upon us and know that we are God. You, however, are not. You are inconsequential. And this is not your, my what, place, privilege, destiny. You disrespect. There are no pleasantries in the deep, only the decaying husks of the oversized parasites towering before me. You take me for a fool, believing I am like all else, manipulated by your psychic machinations. But I will not be controlled, for I am wroth. He allowed us no audience. He knew of our hunger. Abandoned, imprisoned, our vulnerabilities stood clear, and he wasted no time in cracking them open with the rib he tore from the cruel leviathan. You desire life. My witness desires your power. A trade in the stars, your servitude for their lives, he said, lifting the rib and pointing it at my children. Their power requires sustenance. Without it, your witness will have none. The surface of this disgusting rock is lined with their sustenance. Primitive beasts now stand at the verge of new purpose, giving life to your kind once again. I, kind Rulk, will ensure your children survive, and you will aid a righteous cause in return. Outmatched, death would one day be our recompense, but our part was still left to play. Go on then. He snarked, holding the rib out. Sustenance has arrived. I grasped it, and he swam upwards, dragging me in tow, rising up from our deep, taking me away from my children, up and up, away from one prison and toward another. Saita, the mother of the worm gods, accepted Rolk's bargain and was bound in eternal servitude with her children. They would now forever serve the deep, the witness, the darkness's power. From the prison of the Leviathan's making, Saita would be dragged to Rourke's domain, and would forevermore be an aspect of his power. The purpose of the worms and the power that they could provide is demonstrated in the preservation mission where Rourke speaks about them more. Conqueror, many called me. Again and again I heard this word, logged my direction not with admiration, but with malice. Not a conqueror, I would respond with glee. What then, they would ask. I do not tell them my witness. As you so graciously taught me, I show them. Just as I did in the unholy den of those starving worm gods. I'll not forget the stench of their rotting flesh, or the way they cowered as I drew near. But they soon learned I was not to be feared. In the end, 
I left them only a promise of sustenance, and in return, they became chattel for a greater purpose. Absolute finality. And as I walked away, their fountainhead in tow, I could hear them whisper with respect. Subjugator. Saito was not ignorant to the purpose of her children and what they would serve, but also she gleaned insights from her many years of imprisonment as is displayed in the armor of the Titans for the raid greaves in the vow of the disciple. Take a listen. The subjugator did what he does best. Conquer, capture. Many of his victims fell, but those who proved useful served. From a prison within Fundament to another in the dark expanse of his making, I was taken. And that was only the beginning. He knew of our strengths, our powers. To grip the mind and guide, to fill it with vitality and power, to reduce it to rot and waste. The universe is wide, my child, his witness would chide, with wrath matching if not exceeding yours in its vastness. Seek it before it seeks you or it will be your end. He claimed to desire our power for his witness, but I overheard eons of their discussions. His omniscient god always reduced him to that which he claimed, wrath. Though he wore such a designation proudly, he wanted more, wanted our power for himself to continue to do what he does best, better than before, alongside his witness. This is why I was kept, the desire for domination of all things. The subjugator returned living pieces of me to fundament, segments he called a larvae. He set them adrift on the ocean, knowing full well where the current would carry them, to the shores of the Osmium Kingdom. This is the place where the old king of the Osmium Court, the father to the beings that would one day be known as Oryx, Savathun, and Shivua Rath would discover a dead worm familiar, the same dead worm familiar that would lead ultimately to his children, Sathona, Shiro, and Orush, descending into the deep and finding the worm gods. This was the moment at which the plan that had been sown by the Witness and Rulk was ultimately attained. They would gain not only the servitude of the worm gods, but also an eternal race of blood tribute bound slaves, the Hive, who would forever serve and seek the power of the sword logic, who would from this moment onwards fight in the name of the Witness and of the Worms their gods. Shaito would be the mother of all worms, all worm larvae and all worm gods. From here within the domain of Rulk, armies of worms were spawned, and those worms would go on to empower the Krill, from such a union and such a terrible blood tribute that was tied into their life, the Hive were born. And so, Shaita would continue to be the hostage of the Disciple for all eternity. Or at least, that is, until we arrived. She was bound consistently by the sustenance that was promised to her. Sustenance as part of a bargain to save her children sustenance that she still consumed and children that she still birthed in the name of the Disciple. But when we came to strike down the Disciple, we cut off that sustenance born of his power. Thus, the Worm Mother's servitude ended. And in doing this, it seems we ended her as well. Now, she slumbers eternally, but even still, her children linger on determined to carry out her plan. One such of those children was given a moment of reunion at the corpse of its mother, a worm that once inhabited Savathun. Here, worm. Have your family reunion. Worm mother, though you sleep eternal, your role in Grand Symphony persists. Legacy will be carried best I can. Okay, okay, that's enough. Moving on. And so that is the story of the worm in the pyramid. 
It is not Yul or Ur or Aya or Zol or Aka or any other unknown worm. This worm is now known to us. This is a captive, an unfortunate consequence of hunger and the actions of both the Leviathan and the Witness and the Disciple. This is Shaita, the mother of all worms and the source of the worms found throughout the Dark City and the Disciple's Pyramid. This is a mother of evil pressed into her role by a desire to save her children. And that is where our story ends for today. Tomorrow, we're going to be covering the lore behind Rulk himself. We're going to be showing off some lore that talks predominantly about what we discover in the Shattered Suns lore book. That is going to talk about his past and his origins, and ultimately how he came to serve the Witness. But that's for the video tomorrow, and for today, that is all you're going to get from me. Thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed, go ahead and leave a like. And of course, if you have any further questions, go ahead and leave them down below in the comments section. If you want more Destiny content, including coverage of the new raid, Vow of the Disciple, go ahead and simply hit subscribe. There is a lot more to talk about. And remember to hit the bell next to subscribe to turn on those email notifications. But as per usual, know that your viewership is quite enough for me. And that in the meantime, my name has been, my name is Bife. Perodasia Adastra. I'll see you, Starside. <laughs>